actually the very first thing we have is just a quick uh, PowerPoint presentation that the village, the department compiled for us to give you about crash data. It's just a couple slides. This is just a supplement to our main presentation, but this is uh, in response to a number of questions we had specifically about the crashes in town. Um, and this is, unfortunately, it was for, we got it on short notice and it's formatted kind of small, so we'll kind of have to read it to you. Um, but this is just showing what Steve was saying. The first graph here is time of day. Yeah, and that's going to fall. And you can see the, the peak for property damage crashes, which is that orange line. The vast, vast majority of our crashes are property damage only. It's just fender bender, no injuries. You can see there's a peak here. This is 8 a.m., a little bump. Noon, and then it's around 2 or 3 is the highest peak. That's going to be rush hour and the beginning of rush hour. That's just when more people are on the road and when kids are getting out of school and um, those kinds of things. And you can see actually crashes with injuries coincide with that same three, 2 to 3 p.m. bump. And then uh, day of the week, I believe you said Friday was the biggest, and that is right here. Fridays have the highest, highest point. Actually, you see Saturday and Sunday are the middle two, and I know you guys can't see this. It's just, this is Saturday and Sunday. They're the smallest. That's just because... A lot of our traffic in town is based around um, the business park uh, and people going to and from work and there's just a lot less traffic on the road on the weekends because people are staying home or um, a lot of our traffic only comes through when businesses are open. So you can go to the next one. This is yet another, this is laying it out by intersection. So here's Friday. Of the crashes that happened, I believe this was from last year to now. So April 21 to now is uh, 1,273 crashes that were reported to us. Uh, and then of those, 249 of them took place on a Friday, which is the most of the largest. And the biggest, does, can anyone guess what the busiest intersection is for crashes? Does anyone know? Happen to know offhand? Bussy and Oakton. Ah, got it right there, Bussy and Oakton. Um, that's actually in the, course of being reworked right now, I think specifically because it's historically been our worst intersection for crashes. And then you can see um, Bussy, this is broken down strange, but these Bussy Road and Bussy and Oakton seem to have the most of them. This is 13 out of the 249 of them were at Bussy and Oakton. And then Oakton and Bussy, the reverse way is four more. So most of them were in, the, in that general area and uh, the intersections surrounding it. This is just a breakdown of the percentage. So of those 1273 crashes, 88% of them are property damage only, and uh, which is a good thing. That's what we want to see. Uh, crashes are a pain, but when it's just property damage only, at least you can get it fixed easily. Um, injury crashes make up about 12%, and then our fatal crashes make up only less than a fraction of 1% of, uh, in that time frame, there were just two. Uh, Justin, can you, because property damage, when we, get a, when we get dispatched to an accident, they try to get as much information from the people who are involved in the accident as they can. The first thing they usually ask, is anyone injured, you know, things like that. And that will be, that will determine how an officer is going to respond there. We're, I mean, we're still going to get there as quick as we can, but if it comes out to an accident with injuries, that's a sign to us that we need to kind of expedite there. So that's what he's talking about when, that, when, when they dispatch us to property damage only or accident with injuries that kind of determines our response uh, if we need to expedite, correct? Yep. yep. And many property damage only crashes can be relocated off the road. So you're sitting at a stoplight and someone rear ends you. Typically, our dispatcher will always ask you if the cars are movable and if you say yes, they'll ask you to move. And you just, usually there's a gas station or shopping center you can move into. And that's uh, just to keep traffic flowing, keep the roadway open and safer for everybody else, I'm sure. Uh, if you guys have been driving for a while, everyone's come across a crash scene at some point or a stalled car that was in a really bad spot. You thought to yourself, oh, wow, this, this guy's going to get a hit. That's what we're trying to mitigate by having them move so we don't have a second crash and then a third and a fourth. And, uh, Quick question. Yes. How do these numbers look pre-COVID? Uh, that, I, these like, should be, these are actually probably pretty similar. Are they about still the same? This... These numbers here are probably pretty similar. During COVID, though, they were significantly lower. Uh, everything in our town was a lot lower. We had far fewer people on the road. We had far fewer 
tickets written, far fewer crashes going on. Uh, that one year in 2020, we had significantly less, uh, fewer hit and runs. Just every, everyone is staying home, so the numbers are lower. But they've bounced back to pretty typical, except for um, the fatality crashes. We generally, a little higher. yeah, this is slightly higher. Um, but that's just things come and go, and just the roll of the dice. Usually we don't have, we maybe get one a year. Fatals, yeah, yeah. One, or, one or two. Uh, so sometimes it's you know it's it's like the, we get a bunch in one year, but then we get like none for four years. So it, it's but it all balances out. It's about one or two a year, I would say. But I would say these numbers are probably pretty typical of a normal because traffic's came back to normal. It's still not what it used to be, but uh, it feels like we're getting back to as busy as yeah. we have been. And most of the most of the fatalities we've had recently have actually been pedestrians or bicyclists. Um, cars is. Um, Cars have gotten built much safer, um, so there's crashes that we see that wow, it looks real bad, like someone's going to be hurt, but when they're able to walk away, and that's because they're either doing everything right, they had their seatbelt on, the airbags went off. It's a newer model car that has designed for uh, has like these crumple zones. So even though they look really bad, it actually helps dissipate the energy, and makes people safer. But we'll get into that later. In the I think it's just one more slide. slide. This breaks it down by gender. Um, oh, yeah. One more after that. So. This is the was it. There's, There's one more. One more? Okay. Uh, this breaks it down by gender of the operator. And see, so you guys asked one question. You got a ton of data here. Um, <laughs> this breaks down by gender and age. So, not surprisingly, the largest group of people in crashes were males between 25 and 30. Um, I would expect actually more in the teens, but it shoots up significantly here after the 20s. And uh, none that are zero to four years old, which is good. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's. You can so see the, yeah. yeah, that would be why your insurance is more, um, because there's much, much more crashes with but when mail. when you get married, insurance goes down. Maybe they think your wife's driving the car half the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell you what to do. Do you guys have your maps that uh, Ted gave you? Yeah. Here's all locations. It's kind of a, I don't know how uh, useful this is, but it's kind of interesting. This doesn't break it down by seriousness. So this is just anywhere where someone's bumped a sign or gotten into a serious crash. The one that sticks out to me is the Bussy Bus Austin corridor right there. Yeah. This whole circle, Bussy and Higgins. Landmire and Tani, that's a, that looks pretty. Arlington Higgins. But then you see a lot of these that are clustered. These are all apartment parking lots over here. These are just people bumping into each other in the parking lot. You see it does follow the main thoroughfares. Here's Meacham, a lot of them on Meacham. Right. Yeah, that is, that's the last one. So now we're gonna go into our main presentation. Um, what we do in the traffic unit is we're permanently assigned uh, there for roughly six to 10 years, depending on what's going on in the department and uh, how busy we've been. Um, it's, uh, we each get our own assigned squad car, and we're out there. Basically, our jobs are traffic enforcement, uh, hit and run investigation, and serious crash investigation. And then um, we assist patrol whenever they need help on emergency calls and stuff. But we're not the guys that respond to retail thefts or anything. Our our focus is cars on the road and the safety of everyone that's driving in and through town. And so that's what we'll get into here. You want to go back to that first oh, one. So this just shows a general overview of what our duties are, and I just touched on that. They like to refer to it as the three E's. We have enforcement, which is writing uh, tickets, education, which is part of what we're doing right now, and also we go speak to uh, people at the high school. Is it seniors? Or is, it's usually seniors at the high school. And then uh, Officer Guther does a uh, refresher course with seniors at the Hattendorf Center. Yep to help them pass their uh, test to get their license renewed once they get past a certain age. And then we help with roadway engineering. If there's issues where we're seeing a lot of problems, maybe the lights aren't set up the right way, or maybe there's a blind spot in the road where people can't see, we work on that stuff. Crash investigation is a large portion of what we do. Uh, fortunately, very few crashes are fatal, so we don't do a lot of that. We also don't even have a lot of serious injury crashes. The vast majority of our work is hit and run follow-up. 
Uh, anytime somebody hits someone and takes off, if there's a, a possibility of tracking down the offender and resolving the case, it gets assigned to us. To, we're essentially the detective unit, but for crashes. And then we also do special events. Uh, Rotary Fest, we work, uh, the summer concerts, and we help Schaumburg. They have a marathon that goes down Rowling Road. We help them with that. And then uh, we help escort the Christmas tree from wherever it gets cut down in town to Village Hall. So all sorts of special events like that. And then we, because of our large uh, business park, we also do a lot of overweight vehicle and heavy truck enforcement. Trucks have basically a lot more rules than just um, your small passenger car. Uh, for obvious reasons, it's big and uh, it can cause a lot of damage if something goes wrong. So there's a whole, whole other field to just truck enforcement that's, that's pretty specialized. There's uh, only a few officers that are trained specifically just for truck enforcement. So uh, these are all what um, some of the special units in the, in the department are. We do have evidence technicians, we have patrol officers, we have crime prevention, which is what Officer Malik does. We have investigations and we have special events through the village and basically the traffic unit kind of encompasses all that. We do our own evidence work sometimes. We have a, a full-time evidence technician help us sometimes. We do patrolling in town. We try to do crime prevention in terms of maybe reducing speeding in a certain area. We do investigations, like I just said, and then we also do the special events. So it's a very, very wide scope of things that we have to, we have to take care of back in the traffic unit. It's not just sitting there all day with a radar gun writing <laughs> 25 tickets. <laughs> so uh, this is, I, uh, this probably should have been before the flow chart. This is a breakdown of three E's, enforcement, um, we do click it or ticket, which I'm sure you've all either seen or heard about or read in the, the uh, Elk Road paper. They announce that every time it comes around. Overweight vehicle enforcement, uh, educating motorists and the public, uh, and roadway engineering. Another part of that is traffic impact studies. Whenever they want to uh, change a building or say they have a, a building that had a small, small parking lot and they want to they expand and increase the size of their staff and increase the parking lot, one of the things they have us do is look at how that might affect the traffic flow. It's on a really small side street. Maybe the increased traffic would be a hazard and we recommend they should put up a stop sign somewhere or they should put up a stop light or maybe have a striped crossing for pedestrians to get across to another parking lot. So we do, uh, we do things like that whenever there is a change in um, something that might affect the roadway. So now we're going to get into some of the equipment we use. Um, you want to yeah, flip out or? Uh, yeah, you, we can pass some of it. Well, we should go over it first before we pass okay. it around. So we have access to all the standard police equipment that the patrol units use. Same, same equipment is in our cars, but just a little bit more specialized. We obviously have radars. So this is our radar gun. Um, every squad car has the same one, save for one car that has a trial unit of a new one. Um, they're permanently mounted usually in the, wind, in the front windshield like this, and it also has a handheld battery. And we'll get into this a little bit more in detail. But we have radar for speed enforcement. We have LIDAR, which is a laser for speed enforcement. Anyone that's ever used a rangefinder for golfing or anything knows um, it's, it's just like binoculars. And they'll tell you distance and a speed. And then uh, we use tint meters, which is to measure window tint. That's one of these. We'll pass these around once we get into them. Uh, speed signs and traffic counters, which are these that you've probably either seen us putting up around town or you've seen them in use. The total station, which is what we have set up here, uh, that is for measuring um, crash scenes. That shoots out a laser that bounces off of this reflector prism, and it takes a precise measurement of the distance between there and the base of this white and yellow pole. And we use that to uh, create a scale diagram of crash scenes, which we can use to either reconstruct it or take measurements um, and do calculations for speed and things like that. We'll show you some examples of those too. And we so also it's the same, same thing you would see a, a surveyor using if you're driving on the road and you see them wearing the vest and they're doing some construction, same exact piece of equipment. Yeah. And then we've got crash data retrieval, which is basically access uh, airbag control information from the car. And then an accelerometer, which just gives us, uh, we'll go over that one. It, it gives us specific data for determining friction on the roadway and how fast a car can accelerate or slow down. So the main thing we have that we use probably every day and most of the patrol officers use every day as well 
is uh, it's the radar that's in the car. Like I said, we, this is the one we have. It works off the Doppler principle. Um, anybody familiar with what that is? Maybe a handful of you. Uh, if you've ever, you accidentally bumped it. Oh. I'm gonna go back. <laughs> um, basically, it measures the change in frequency of radio waves that come out of here. Anyone that's ever heard a train go past him or an ambulance and the tone changes and the siren as it goes by you, that's because the sound waves are being compressed in front of you and stretched when it goes past you. This is the exact same way this works. It knows um, how, it knows the frequency of the wave it sends out, and then if a car is coming towards it, it'll compress those waves when it comes back and it'll measure the change. And if a car is going away, it'll, they'll be stretched out and it measures the change there. It basically, it just has a very fast calculator inside here that can do the math there to figure out what the different, they call it frequency shift, means in terms of is that car going 35, is it going 40, is it going 50, and um, it works very well. It can pick out the difference between a car coming towards you and going away from you, and uh, it's very, technology has been the same since they started using them back in, I think, the 50s or 60s, yeah. and uh, it's very reliable and very, um, very, uh, works very well for us. Do people still use radar jammer? You know, uh, when I started driving, we were doing the radar detectors, mm -hmm. and some people were doing the jammers. People still try to use those? They probably do. Radar detectors are legal in Illinois. Um, they legal. They are legal. To, yes. Radar detectors are legal in Illinois. There's some states where they're not. Uh, here they are. You can go to Walmart and buy one off the shelf. Um, we still catch people speeding with radar detectors all the time. They're not the, they're not the best thing in the world. I, have, I think I've seen their use kind of declining. I don't feel like I see as many as I used to. Um, was there a time when they said that certain radars weren't detected by radar detectors? Uh, they had, well, there's different yeah. bands, so, okay. um, and they maybe potentially like one of the radar detectors had a band that it didn't pick up. I think ours used KA band, which I couldn't tell you necessarily what that means, but I know there's different uh, variables and bands. Yeah, there's three different bands. It's all based on how narrow the waves are that come out of the front of the gun and they had to stop using one of them because it's basically the same frequency as automatic doors use to detect that you're, and uh, like if you've ever had, uh, back when you were, um, if you ever knew someone that had a radar detector or you have one and you've driven past Jewel and it goes off and when you're driving right up the front, that's because their automatic doors are setting it off. Um, a lot of those police radars that use that are going out of service for that reason. You don't want to have too much of that bouncing around because it causes interference. That's why Steve and I couldn't stand here and each have one of these because it might one might interfere with the other. Um, so you try to keep them a little bit separate. And to kind of touch on what he was talking about with people having radar detectors and we're still able to get their speed. And I've had people that I have stopped and said, well, I have, you didn't get my speed. I, I had my radar detector. There's a function on there where it won't, um, it's not transmitting yet. So we can turn it on real quick and it'll get the speed. And as soon as that pops up for us, what speed the particular vehicle we're pointing at is going, it probably wouldn't radar detector go off, so it's at the same amount of time. It's instantaneous. What it will probably pick up is people that have their radars transmitting and on, and they're driving around, but sometimes people do that, but if someone's specifically looking for... You guys will see this when you do your ride-alongs. Uh, officers have their personal preference. You can either have this constantly on, or you can have it on, uh, on hold, which basically, like this one is right now. If I turn it on, it's not going to be measuring any speed until I either hit a button on the remote or pull the trigger, and then it turns it on right away and gets a speed and then you let go and it turns itself, it, not off, but it, it turns off the beam. So it'll still be on and ready to activate. And that is helpful because you're not just driving around broadcasting a radar signal to anybody with a $50 radar detector. <laughs> um, and it also, I think, uh, makes it, uh, I like to do it that way personally. Um, but to finish your question, jammers are illegal uh, of any kind, yeah. Uh, you can't have anything that actually interferes with the signal of this. So, do you have another question somewhere? Yeah. Um, so, wait, can you can you use them when you're heading towards a vehicle, like while you're moving, and and their uh, vehicle is heading towards you? Yes, these work both stationary and moving. Um, we had older models before I got hired that could only do one or the other, and you had to press a button to switch it. These are autom these automatically detected. These are actually plugged into the same port on our cars that when you go get your emissions test done, they plug into. So it, it this car sends a signal to this to tell it that it's moving. So it automatically will switch 
from stationary to moving mode. And then you can get vehicles going uh, away from you, coming towards you. And then actually, his car and my car, we both have antennas on the back of our car too. So people catching up to us, or if they pass us the other direction going away, we can measure those as well. Is it like a shotgun, or does it? I mean, I don't know. Sure. That's the analogy there. I use because, well, the next thing we're going to talk about is the LIDAR, and that's more of a, using your analogy, is more like a rifle where it's, it's very narrow beam, but this would be more like a spread. The further away you are, the, the more uh, those waves spread out. So it's not as good for uh, far away as the next device we're going to talk about. I have a question. Sure. You have a group of cars going, and they're all speed. Mm -hmm. You just pick the one that's going the fastest, or, what do you, or how do you decide when you first have to pull over? That's all officer discretion. Um, lots of times in heavy traffic, it can be difficult to do speed enforcement um, because it's, it takes a lot of training and practice to be able to pick out the specific car and familiarity with the unit itself. Uh, we've been using these, uh, this particular radar unit for a very long time, so we know kind of its quirks. And you can, because this doesn't tell you black Volkswagen Beetle left lane. <laughs> you have to be able to yeah. identify the vehicle that's speeding, kind of guess at how fast they're going, and then use this to confirm it. And if it's heavy traffic, it's going to be tough because you're going to be picking up multiple cars. And it, then it becomes uh, not very safe to pull out into the traffic to catch up to that person, make everybody stop and get out of the way, and then pull them over in traffic and then move them off the road. So lots of times it, it can be very difficult to do speed enforcement, like at rush hour on Arlington Heights Road or on Beaster Field. Um, it's especially with the radar, which, like Officer Guther says, is more like a broad, I think uh, at 1,000, we have a slide in another presentation. At 1,000 feet, these might be, the beam is about 200 feet wide, which covers the whole curb to curb on most of our streets. Uh, so it does take a lot of uh, uh, experience using it to be able to tell. And then one of the things the officers are supposed to do is, once they see a number on here, um, think to themselves, does that make sense? Does does 56 seem right for the conditions, the amount of traffic that's out there, how I guessed they were going? If, uh, if you get a number here that says 85 miles an hour and there's heavy traffic and you thought they were doing 55, maybe let that one go because it might be just a quirk in here. And that's that discretion and that ability to filter out the ones that might be um, little quirks with the radar, kind of adding speeds together or misreading something are one of the things we train our new officers to make sure they do um, because we don't want anybody writing tickets that are not to the correct vehicle or not for the right speed. Basically, you can't solely rely on just the number that gives you. you have to, we have to be able to articulate on our, our citation when we go to court and say, hey, you know, this car, you know, the radar said this. It looked like it was driving, traveling at a high rate of speed. I saw it passing other cars. So all those factors put together is kind of, and this just helps kind of solidify that. And, yeah, we're actually hoping after our break we're going to take you guys down to the garage and let you each try this out so you can actually see how it works. Um, on, we were going to go outside. I don't think anyone wants to do that right now. Uh, so we'll stay indoors. Oh, it's a real experience. Go outside. Yeah. <laughs> Give you an Elkro police rain jacket and everything. Yeah. So the second uh, speed measurement device we have, which is more precise, and we kind of refer to this, this is more of a, like a rifle versus a shotgun because this you, you point this at a specific vehicle and it gives you the speed of that vehicle. And I actually think I have a picture on the next slide. Um, yeah, you can pass one in each direction. They're very small. They're just like a set of binoculars. You look through the single eyepiece in the back. You look through the rubber one on the back. There you go. So this is just point and shoot. Um, at 1,000 feet, this beam is only about 3.5 feet wide, so it's very, very precise. There's really no chance you're going to be pointing at the wrong car. When would you use that versus the other one? It has limitations. So this one doesn't work well through glass, for instance. So oh, okay. whereas the radar, like Officer uh, Erdus was saying, is it's mounted in the, uh, on the dash and shooting through the windshield. That's how the radar goes, but you can't do it with the LiDAR. So, oh, okay. so these are where your window has to be down. Uh, you can't be moving. So the radar can do stationary and moving. The laser can't pick out, um, can't separate out your speed from the vehicle speed. So you have to be parked. Um, you have to have your window down so you can shoot through it. So today would not be a good day for it. And it doesn't work if it's snowing because all the snow reflects the light back and kind of it really shortens the distance. It'll work. But you, we can read cars' speeds 
out to 1,500 or 2,000 feet with these. They're, they're really, they go really far and um, they're really accurate. Um, actually, as of today, they're all re recertified yeah. accurate. Um, but this, again, personal preference. Um, officers that don't necessarily just want to sit in one spot and do speeding tickets all day, don't bother with them. Um, others like it better because in heavier traffic, you can point it, you can actually point that and say, oh, I'm going to measure the speed on that white Tesla. I'm going to measure the speed of that red Jeep. It's tough to see on that slide, but you can see the crosshairs are on that Honda Accord. And it says 48 miles per hour. And it says 594 and a half feet away from the laser unit. So this, there's that, there's, given how narrow that beam is, there's absolutely no way it's reading this car or this car. It's that one. And that's why you put the crosshairs. We usually aim for a license plate because they're reflective and they're usually dead center in the car. Um, or headlights work well too. Now, bonus question, can anyone tell where this picture was taken from? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's horrible over there. Uh, see, that's called a clue, a yeah. sign in the picture. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that's, uh, that is uh, the south lot behind the high school on Arlington Heights Road. Keep the mood lighting like that to help your slides. Yeah, <laughs> we might leave it like that. There's no sleeping, all right? <laughs> <laughs> so is that what you use when you're sitting in the parking lot? Of you can. You can use a radar there, too, but just like he was talking about, there's certain limitations and advantages and disadvantages to each of the tools. So during heavy traffic, that radar wouldn't be good for here because with how these cars are stacked on that picture, it might be hard to differentiate which they make it all the way around. which speed the radar's saying. Whereas the LiDAR, there's no question. You point the license plate. Or, yeah, yes, sir. How much does the angle of approach matter? Like, you know, if they're crossing right in front of you versus a 45. That's a that very good question. That is called the cosine effect, which basically means, I don't, do we have a slide on that or no? It's a little too in depth. The further away you are offset, right? Let's say the squad car is here and the other corner is someone passing this way. The bigger that angle is, uh, the more it offsets it and it gives actually the advantage to the driver meaning it's going to under-report the speed. So maybe they're going 55, but if I'm reading it from here, it's going to give me a reading of 50. So if anything, it benefits the driver. So ideally, we try to stay straight on. Which, as you can see in this picture, the position of the squad car right there, <laughs> the traffic is coming right at them. So they're going to have a dead, dead center angle. And we try to keep uh, our squad car as close to the roadway as we can for that reason, um, to reduce the, the error that's in there. Um, fortunately, though, like uh, Officer Guther said, the error does always favor the driver. Like um, the vehicle going the other way in that picture, you, you probably wouldn't have been able to get a good reading. Not, not at that point, but once he gets up here, you can. Once that you angle can. straightens out a bit, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, he wouldn't be there. That's the oncoming lane. <laughs> he, once he gets over here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead. And this is just a depiction of the difference in the beams. The radar sends out a much wider beam. Um, the laser is much more precise. It takes a lot less of the guesswork out of it, but it does have its limitations. It is more difficult to use. Um, fewer time frames. You have to have the right spot. Um, you can't be moving at the stationary. Yep.